Dear fellow redeemed, we consider especially the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come, and it'll be a fairly short sermon because pastor could just say, read what we just read from Luther's small catechism as printed in your service folder, and that'll summarize everything. We'll take just a little bit more time looking at it. Because there's a lot that Jesus tells us here that we can't perceive with our eyes. Paul puts it like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That from Ephesians chapter 6. And it would be very simple and very easy to think to ourselves, why do I need to pray? And what is the value of, of regular church attendance week in and week out? What is the value of spending a little bit of time with the Word of God as I have my morning coffee? Because it doesn't look like it does much. Because it doesn't look like it does much. <laughs> but there's so much that we don't see. So much that we don't see around us. Paul puts it this way, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Because the kingdom of God, the ruling activity of God, is not a flesh and blood thing. It's not a location. When we use that term, the, the kingdom of Christ, when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're not talking about even a place. We're talking about the presence of Jesus Christ himself. The presence of Jesus Christ himself in the hearts of believers here and in heaven and around the world. The presence of Jesus Christ himself. And one thing that you have to know about our God, whenever he is present somewhere, he is doing something. Whenever he is present somewhere, he is doing something. And so, you know, God is here today in a very general way present with the chair that you are sitting on to make sure that it retains all of its chairly qualities and keeps you from falling flat onto the floor. God is present even more specifically and specially within your heart. That when God baptized you into his family, his ruling activity began. And he came to dwell within you in a very special way. So that now your body and your life and your actions are one offering and one temple to God himself. And even more specifically, God comes to rule and it makes himself present in a very special way in the Lord's Supper. He makes himself present in body and in blood. And you're saying to yourself, Pastor Hagen, thy kingdom come. Okay, I get it. Probably the best example that I could think of for, for this petition is a man named James. We'll call him James because because <laughs> that's his real name. James um, wasn't a member when I got there in Ottawa, 2011. He had been a member there. He had been confirmed there, but um, you know how it is. Sometimes personalities maybe clash, or something is taken the wrong way, or um, you know, under the umbrella term, had a bad experience with church. And for whatever reason, James's aunt still came. His mother came every now and then, and once or twice, once or twice, James came and sat with them. And they sat right in the front row because that's, that was the most handicapped accessible place for his mother to sit. The ruling activity of Christ. We pray thy kingdom come. We pray bring your ruling activity to one more heart. Extend your kingdom, extend your reign, your ruling activity to one more person. And when James walked in that day, he maybe, probably, I think he did, he did know the facts of his faith. He was able to recite, you know, the, the structure a little bit of a couple of commandments. He was able to say, you know, the historical facts of Jesus died on a cross, you know, in Palestine around 33, give or take. And Jesus literally rose from the dead bodily. He's able to say all that. But that day, that first day that he walked into the church, 
hungover, <laughs> a little scruffy, and living with a life that really had no regard for what God had said in his word. That day, we could see the battle was on. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities of the kingdoms of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And what does God's church do <laughs> in this battle? We fold our hands and we pray, Thy kingdom come. Lord, extend your ruling activity here within my heart that the gates of hell are pushed back even further. Extend your ruling activity among us, that, that people don't fall prey to the lies of the devil and the temptations of this world. Extend your ruling activity in this, in this community, that people who are, who are burdened by guilt and who fall prey to either the lie that God doesn't care or the lie that God does care and God will never forgive you, two equally damning lies. To people who, Lord, extend your kingdom, your ruling activity, to these people who fall prey to the lies of the devil, so that they may know the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what God's people do. We bow our heads and we pray, Lord, do your work. And Jesus does. Because you understand, that's, that's one of the most unique things, probably the most unique thing about our faith, as opposed to any other faith in the whole entire world. I don't care what it is. In every other religion, they will tell you about your God. They will tell you about what you should do, give you instructions for how to live. But here, here in the Christian faith, Jesus makes himself present. That when pastor reads, it's not just you know, the voice of pastor, but the voice of Jesus himself. That you aren't just coming here to hear about Jesus. You're coming here to meet Jesus. Underneath spoken word and sacrament. Because it's at this place where Jesus extends his ruling activity. And it's at this place where even our readings today, you look at that and you might say to yourself, oh my, well, Ecclesiastes, that's, that's difficult enough. Meaningless vapor, bah, pain fills his days. And that second reading from James, even more pointed, um, everybody who reads the book of James starts squirming because there's no gospel there. It's very stern, very stern law against Christians who had taken their faith for granted. But it's through these words that Jesus desires to extend his ruling activity. By warning Christians against, against temptation and by pointing out the lies of the devil, and that lie could be no clearer, at least the one we're talking about today, the lie of Satan could be no clearer than in our gospel reading from Luke chapter 12. And the story that Jesus tells, he talks about and he points out the lie of greed, the idolatry of money. <laughs> And he points it out and he says, you know what, friends? He, this, uh, he doesn't say it quite like this, but this is what he means. He says, you know what, friends? This blessing of, of cash in your pocket and this blessing of an investment in 401k or 403b or what have you, it's a blessing from God, but don't fall prey to idolatry because that blessing from God is going to make the exact same promises that God himself makes except only God can keep those promises. You understand that, right? That the money that God has blessed us with makes us promises. <laughs> promises such as contentment and peace and security. Promises like, like status and longevity. That if you have enough money, you could find some way to, uh, to follow all the, the Silicon Valley billionaires and do all these crazy things that are supposed to extend your life and lengthen your telomeres so that you, you don't age, but you actually get younger. Crazy stuff. The promises of money make the same promises that God himself makes, except money can't, can't follow through on that. But the reason we're here isn't to talk about money specifically. It's to talk about the, the ruling activity of Jesus, who is present in his word. And he says, dear friends, he knows. 
He knows the worries and the concerns of life in this world. And he doesn't want us to get led astray by them. He points us back to himself. And so we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Extend your ruling activity in my heart so that I'm not led astray by temptation and lie. James came back. It wasn't just that one day. This must have been early 2012, I think. James came back, and, and we struck up a conversation. He was about my age, and, uh, and he had a, had a hobby with video games or something like that. And, um, and eventually one day I said to him, Hey, James, you've been coming for a couple of weeks now, and you're sober. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is a good change. And I want to help encourage you in that. And encourage you in your Christian faith. Because our struggle isn't against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the powers, the rulers, and authorities of this dark world. And so how does God's church work? Well, God's church works exactly the same way as, as the way he brought you to faith. The ruling activity of Christ is extended as Jesus works through word and sacrament. So we sat down for a Bible class together. And this, this Bible class that was, you know, 15 lessons long, and um, usually if, if I took a long time, it was an hour and a half per lesson, well, for him it was more like three and a half hours, because we, he had a lot of questions, and we talked, and you could almost see it between the look in his eye and the change in his demeanor of how Jesus gained more and more territory in the heart of this believer as the gates of hell kept retreating due to um, contact with the word of God as the, the temptations of the devil were pointed out and, and named for what they were as the lies of Satan were illuminated with the truth of God's word the ruling activity of Christ spread within his heart and within his family Thy kingdom come. You know, we look at our readings today and, and we look at that specific temptation that says, you know, watch out for be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And you might say to yourself, well, <laughs> uh, good thing, Pastor. I'm not like that, uh, that guy in the parable because um, he's got all his wealth and he doesn't know what to do with it. And he's obviously set his heart on that. I, I don't have that kind of wealth. I've got a fairly, you know, modest income and a bit of debt. And, you know, whew, thank God, I don't have to worry about greed. At least that specific temptation. <laughs> but do we realize that the obsession with wealth or the obsession with, with debt and the worry, basically that worry is just the, the counterpart to greed in different clothing. Examine your own heart. And where has the devil led you astray with his lies and his temptations? Maybe it's this whole idea of greed, seeing what we do have, or worry, seeing what we don't have. Maybe it's falling prey to, to some other lie that pastor knows nothing about. <laughs> but the reality is that Jesus today wants to extend his ruling activity within your heart, among our congregation, and in this community. Thy kingdom come. That's what we're praying. Thy kingdom come. Extend your ruling activity within my life. Make yourself present again, Lord, exactly as you said. And roll back the armies of Satan and point out the temptations and the lies that oppose me. Because you do know the reality of where you stand. That Jesus rose from the dead, literally. And that is God's guarantee that your sin has been forgiven. And he clothes you with his righteousness. As he says a little bit later in, in Ephesians chapter 6, that breastplate of righteousness, don't think that that is your own righteousness. Heaven's sakes, no way. That's the righteousness of Jesus where he puts his armor on you and on me and says, dear friend, you know the lies of the devil. You know the accusations he's going to shoot your way. But you've been declared not guilty. You've been declared God's own beloved child. And now pray, thy kingdom come. Because your status as a redeemed child of God 
And my status, our status, as redeemed children of God isn't always matched by our, our state, at least in this world. Our status as a redeemed child of God and our state in this world of being people who fall prey to temptation and lies. And so we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Extend your ruling activity within my heart so that I know what you have made me to be. So that I know the reality of the forgiveness you've won for me. And one day it was... Um, I think it was about eight, eight months, maybe only six months before we left Ottawa. Big, long church. you got to picture this. Like 32 pews on each side. And, um, and it looks halfway full when there's 120 people there. Um, big, long, long um, stone church. And he comes up to the front on his day of confirmation. And I asked him, do you this day reject the, the, the devil with all of his lies and all of his empty promises? And loudly enough for this entire church to hear, yes, I do. Do you this day declare that you believe that Luther's small catechism is a faithful exposition of the word of God? And do you intend to remain faithful to this truth and faithful in use of word and sacrament until the day Jesus die, returns or until the day you die? <laughs> Even putting up with ridicule, bullying, and death rather than fall away. And sure enough, <laughs> loudly enough for all to hear, yes. I do. The ruling activity of Christ extended to another. And the ruling activity of Christ elicited and spoke forth, not with the, the trumpet call of the angels of God, but with the voice of another Christian standing up to say, this is what I believe, and far be it from anybody else to wrench it out of my hands. Far be it from the devil himself to lie me out of heaven. Because I know that my Jesus tells the truth. And I know that my Jesus had made promises that he has always and will always follow through on. And that nothing and no one in any other place, any other time, can do what Jesus has said he would do. That Jesus rose from the dead for me. And that he clothes me again. And that when we gather together, when we gather together, we're not just here to talk about God's law or God's gospel. We're not just here to talk about the facts of Jesus' life. We're here to have Jesus minister to your heart personally and individually because the ruling activity of Christ takes place here. Thy kingdom come. And um, a little while after that, James rode with me. We had uh, what they call a school of outreach at one of our local churches there in Ottawa. We had three churches. They had, um, back in the mid-70s, they left the Missouri Synod, became an independent congregation for a while, and then they ended up joining the Wisconsin Synod. And when they joined the Wisconsin Synod, they closed down their school and planted two congregations with, with that budgeted money. And so we're going out to the School of Outreach, you know, 20 minutes out to the, the uh, that would be East End, yeah, <laughs> the East End of Ottawa. And, and he's riding with me that day. And he says, um, you know, Pastor, I don't know what to do with my life, but I'm glad you can't ask me to come along today. I said, I am too. Because you know what? There is, there's nothing, there's nothing like seeing the blinders come off little by little as people come into contact with the Word of God. There's nothing in my life that compares to that. On the way back, he said, well, you know, Pastor, maybe um, I'd like a little bit of information about that school you told me back in, back in New Ulm, Minnesota. Because maybe this pastor thing, you know, he had been kind of at loose ends and wondering what to do, and he thought, you know, I'll pursue that a little bit and see where that takes me. So I got him some information and put him in touch with the guidance counselor there. And then, um, and then shortly after that, took a call to southern Minnesota, which is only, you know, 45 minutes, maybe, well, it was 55 minutes door to door from our house up to MLC in New Ulm, which our, our offerings help support. And I fell out of touch with him a little bit for the next year or two. He didn't initially, initially pursue um, studying for the ministry. But, you know, being friends on Facebook, I saw a thing or two um, that made me, made me realize 
made me realize that this young man had fallen prey to the lies of the devil again. So I spoke to him about it. I said, you know, it, what it was doesn't really matter. It's another lie of the devil and a temptation that drags people away from, from Christ. And I spoke to him and I said, you know, this, this is, isn't really right. You should uh, you know, go talk to your pastor and get this straightened out. And he did. The ruling activity of Christ took back the ground that it had lost in his heart. Thy kingdom come. That when Christians prayed that prayer here and around the world ten years ago or eight years ago, God answered that prayer in that young man's life by bringing him back into faithful attendance and faithful hearing of the word of God. A short while after that, you know, James, who was, you know, kind of back on the track of, um, you know, this, this Lutheranism thing is pretty cool, um, he, he got married. And then a short while after that, as he was delivering what to do next with his life and his, his new young family, he was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And somebody looking at that might say, well, where is the ruling activity of Christ? Where is the kingdom of Christ? Because here's this young man who has, who has now recommitted himself to life with, with his Lord, and the ruling activity of Christ is present there, but, but now this. It was about seven months later that, uh, that James entered heaven. He was the first, first confirmant I've ever had. Um, I wasn't there for the funeral, I caught it on YouTube. <laughs> but the first confirmation that I've ever had, to my knowledge, that is now in heaven. Where our prayer, thy kingdom come, was answered in its fullness. Where the ruling activity of Christ had entered that man's heart when he was baptized as a baby. The ruling activity of Christ regained that heart through contact with the word of God. The ruling activity of Christ took over his heart and his life, even down to his final day, where now, now he stands in heaven. And he doesn't need to be mediated in his contact with God, where, in other words, God doesn't come to him in word and sacrament, hidden underneath these things, in a kingdom that cannot be seen or perceived or touched or handled. God comes to him directly and makes himself known directly, in full vision and in full sight. That's what we're praying. Lord, extend your ruling activity, your kingdom, in my heart. Lord, extend your ruling activity through our congregation and within our congregation. Lord, extend your ruling activity in this community. We're praying, bring more people to faith, as you promised, that they and we together may live forever in the kingdom of Christ, in a, a visible place called heaven. And so that day when, when James walked through the door <laughs> and God started, you know, the gospel made its advance through his heart and through his life, that day your prayer, our prayer, was answered. And you know what? God wants to do that again. So we pray, thy kingdom come. Amen.